Hey guys, welcome back to Stanley Boy Reviews. I'm your host, Stanley. Thank you so much for taking the time to check out my channel and to talk about your favorite horror films and my favorite horror films. We are wrapping up another month here at Stanley Boy Reviews, and we are taking a break from reviewing movies this week, and we are going to talk to another actor. Last month, we talked to Denise Richards. This month, we are going to talk to Mr. Billy Gallo. He played Sal Romero in 1988's cult classic, Night of the Demons, which happens to be one of my top 10 favorite horror films. This is a really big deal for me. If you haven't yet, guys, please subscribe because there are so many more things to come for Sandy Boy Reviews. We have more cool reviews, more cool interviews. A lot of cool things are in store. So without any further ado, I'm going to have a seat. You have a seat. Let's get to it. Going to twist your back like mine, so you'll never get out of bed again. Never get out of bed again. Never get out of bed again. <laughs> ah! 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 Yeah. What's up, man? It's nice to meet you. It's nice to meet you. Thank you so much for doing this interview, man. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's my pleasure. How's your day? It's going great. How's your day going? You know what? It's okay. It's a beautiful day in my neck of the woods. All right, cool. Well, welcome. Welcome to this. I review horror films. I just started doing this on January 1st. I, I act and I write for the most part. And then I just wanted to start doing something creative and fun come this new year. And I was like, you know what? I'm just going to start a YouTube channel and start reviewing horror films because I, I like horror films. And I, I'm, I'm friendly with a few celebrities and uh, one of them is Denise Richards. So I interviewed her and it was fun. And I, I thought I would ask other people and to, 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 to do it afterwards. So um, thank you. I'm honored that you invited me to be on your your uh, your show. So very cool. Yeah, man. It's an honor for me. Night of the Demons was uh, one of the first horror films I ever saw. I saw it at one of my sister's sleepovers. She had a bunch of bunch of her girlfriends over, and it scared the shit out of me <laughs> as a kid. And uh, it was one of my first introductions to horror films, and uh, it 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 grew a, a big fascination for the horror genre in general. That's in big part to you. So thank you. Oh, you're welcome. How old were you? <laughs> um, I was probably six. I was probably you watched six. Night of the Demons at six. Yeah, yeah, it's it's wild. The first horror film I ever saw was Pet Cemetery, and it traumatized me. But um, <laughs> as, as willingly, Night of the Demons was something I willingly watched. And I mean, I was not much older, um, and I probably shouldn't have been watching it. But uh, <laughs> it started it started a um a, a love for uh, movies and horror movies alike. And so I, I, I act as well. And I've been taking classes for the last however many years. And that's what I originally came out to LA to do. Awesome. I, I love that you, you, you have a studio and that you teach and that you are just, you do a variety of things as well as act. I think that's really inspiring. You know, I found my true passion. It's, you know, I, you know, I've been there, done that, got the t-shirt to prove it, as you can see, you know, by, 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 you know, the, the movie posters, I've been blessed, you know, I'm, you know, I'm a kid who came out to Hollywood at 18 with 200 bucks in his pocket and a one-way ticket. You know, I didn't have a, know anybody out here. I didn't know a soul out here, but I just knew in my heart that I had this dream and I wanted to do it. And, you know, I've been blessed. I've been working active for, you know, 35 years. And, uh, you know, about seven years ago, I got a calling and it was like a, like a little voice going, hey, you, you need to open up an acting studio. You know, when I moved to the South Bay, you know, I was looking for a place to work out myself and I didn't want to drive all the way to Hollywood. And, you know, I looked around and I couldn't find a real acting studio. So I said, why not build it? And uh, I did, you know, I built the studio and it's been my passion. I love being able to guide other actors. I wish there was somebody like me when I came out to Hollywood yeah. to go, hey, man, this is the path. This is don't stay away from that. Go. There's a pothole over here. Stay away from that guy over there, you know. It's like I had no guidance and I had to learn the hard way. So yeah. now I am the guide, you know, and I can't tell you how many actors have knocked on my door and, and with, you know, like uh, no clue on how to get started into the business. Sure. And, you know, when sure. I'm done with them, they're working actors. I mean, exactly. I, that's what I do. You know, I'm, I am, you know, I, I created a podcast two years ago called the Hollywood dream maker podcast. And that's what I do. I, if you have a dream, then it's my obligate if I feel like I can make your dream a reality you know if you work with me I, you know I know the path 
Yeah. And uh, it's been really rewarding. I, it's more rewarding for me when my actors text me, email me or whatever and say, hey, I got that job. I got my SAG card. I got an agent. I got a, you know, that, for me, that fills me up because, you know, younger actor was about me, ego, you know, and and now it's truly uh, the secret is, you know, the secret to living is giving and being of service. And for me, that that that's what fills me up. Yeah. You know, and that's my my passion, being able to help others, you know, achieve their dream. I love that, man. Where are you from? Where did you grow up? I grew up in Brooklyn, New York, uh, in uh, kind of a you know, tough neighborhood. It was it was rough. You know, my childhood was a rough childhood. You know, if, uh, you know, broken home, a lot of abuse. Um, if there was a checklist of everything that could possibly go bad to a child, well, I check all the friggin' boxes. You know, my father wasn't around. It was my mother trying to raise three kids by herself on the mean streets of Brooklyn, uh, you know, doing whatever she had to do. She was, you know, kind of in a fragile state. She was only 21 years old. And, you know, I ran away from home at 15. Okay. And at, at 15, I was literally running the streets, you know, looking for, um, you know, a family, a father figure, um, found that on the streets. You know, I'm, I'm talking, I grew up in a neighborhood which was very heavy, you know, this was, you know, early 80s in New York City, in Brooklyn, there was a lot of uh, mafia, you know, and, and those sure. are some of the guys I looked up to, some wise guys in my neighborhood. And, you know, I was kind of following around and doing, you know, dumb things. And um, one day I saw my idol get shot in the head in front of me five times. And and I, as I looked at, down at his body and, and, you know, he was bleeding out and I was like, maybe this is not the life for me, that I had to change direction, you know, and I, uh, I, I, I left the streets behind and I, I got over the Brooklyn Bridge into Manhattan and I found the theater and I found Lee Strasberg and I found my true passion. You know, I knew I always had it in me. I always knew I wanted to be an actor, but everybody I told my dream to kind of poo-pooed it, you know, shit on it, told me, laughed at me, told me it couldn't be done. So that drove me, you know, it was like, don't tell me I can't do something. <laughs> I'll yeah. prove you wrong, you know? So that really truly motivated me and drove me to, to go after my dream. And, um, you know, luckily for me, when I came out here, I, uh, I started working immediately. So I, I was pretty blessed. What was it like studying at the Lee Strasberg studio? Uh, well, for me at the time, listen, I had no money. So I, I literally convinced them to let me study there. Uh, I would sweep floors, I would clean toilets, I would do anything to, to take classes there. And um, they went for it. So I was literally going to class on Saturdays. It was amazing. I mean, I, I was highly motivated to go to class because I was the only boy in a class with 20 something actresses, you know, beautiful young actresses. And, you know, I was 16, you know, so <laughs> I was, I was there. I was everybody's scene partner. I was highly motivated to get to class. Sure. Yeah. But, you know, studying at least Strasberg was great. It gave me a serious foundation of the craft of acting. Then from there, my director from Lee Strasberg was, uh, they were casting a play at the actor studio um, in New York city and the, my, my acting teacher told me about an audition. I went in there and I got that part. And the next thing I was on stage at the, act, the actor studio, you know, the prestigious actor studio where, you know, Marilyn Monroe and, you know, James Dean and, you know, the, all, the, all the great actors were on that stage. And it was, uh, that's when I truly knew, okay, well, this, this is the path for me. At 18, when I turned 18, I said, I'm, you know, I was at a racetrack. I want to call up a couple hundred bucks on a race. And my friend said, what are you going to do with the money? I said, I'm going to Hollywood. And I packed my bags and I came out with 200 bucks. And, uh, you know, I showed up in Hollywood and, you know, I had seen it in the movies, you know, the palm trees and the sunshine and, you know, all that stuff. And, you know, I get to Hollywood and it's just, it's pouring rain, like for two weeks. I, I remember I got here, it was December I left right before Christmas. I got here December 15th, 1984. And it was just pouring rain. You know that song, It Never Rains in Southern California? Until the yeah. day you get here. Yeah, yeah. My, my ass. <laughs> it rained like cats and dogs. You know, and I was literally, it was Christmas time. I was in a little dumpy little motel because I went out. I thought, you know, when I got here, I was like, I told the cab driver to go to Universal, you know, Universal, because when I was 11 years old, they were filming a movie in my neighborhood. I was a little kid coming home from the park and I saw all the cameras and the trucks and I ran down the street. I go, well, what's going on over here? And this is, you know, we're making a movie. 
I ran up to uh, Marlon Brando's wife in The Godfather. Her name was Morgana King. And, uh, she, you know, I said, how do you get in a movie? I want to be in a movie. And she showed me a picture and a resume. I took, I ran home, I took a Polaroid picture of myself, wrote some shit down on a piece of loose leaf paper, ran down the street and said, hey, here's my picture and resume. She got a kick out of it. She gave it to the director. The director said, go home, kid, you know, you go get your parents. We're going to stick you in the movie. You know, they needed kids to, you know, background, you know, in the neighborhood, you know, playing stickball or whatever. I ran home and I, I was like, mom, ah, they're going to stick me in a movie. And she's like, you stay in the house. You don't know what kind of movie they're making over there. You know, so I, I ran outside. I grabbed the director by the arm. I dragged him to the house. I said, my mother doesn't believe you. You got to tell her you're going to put me in the movie he walked to the house and he said you know we're universal pictures and uh we, we want to use your put your son in the film and uh we're gonna you know pay him my mother was like you're gonna pay him <laughs> go ahead take him <laughs> so when i showed up to set i don't know if you know the actor glenn scarpelli glenn scarpelli was had a, a speaking role in the film and we looked identical so when i showed up to set as a background glenn scarpelli wasn't in that day so everybody thought i was him so oh, they gave wow. me the star treatment. They gave me the chair, the powdering my nose, craft services. And I played along like, yeah, they were calling me Glenn. I was like, yeah, I'm Glenn. Sure. And I was sitting, I was sitting in his, you know, in his chair, you know, so I, I, that's when I got bit, you know, and then a year later they were filming Saturday Night Fever in my neighborhood. And I watched John Travolta, you know, they were doing this big fight scene in the Barracuda Club and the car and the dragging the guy and there's a big stunt. And I was like to four or five in the morning watching John Travolta and he came out of his trail and the girls were screaming and it was just madness. And I got his autographs. And at that point I looked at it and I said, that's what I want to do. I'm going to do that. Those are the things that kind of planted the seeds for me that like I knew I wanted to act, but then, you know, life, you know, the streets kind of pulled me in a different direction, but I always had this dream in me. I knew that this is what I wanted to do. And, you know, it took an event like, you know, my friend dying for me to go, I, I got to go after that. You know, I don't want to live this life. I got to get out of Brooklyn. Did, did uh, so you grow I, up in a big family? I have two sisters, two older sisters, you know, but oh, they the were, you know, they were, they were, uh, you know, really smart. They were like, you know, college at 16, you know, going. And so it was just kind of me. And you know, I was, a, I was a bit of, uh, you know, the black sheep, the little juvenile delinquent, you know, thank God I had a, a strong mother that, you know, kind of ripped me off the streets, you know, she'd pull me off the corners and, you know, somebody would get shot on the corner. <laughs> she was, you know, trying to, you know, be both mom and dad. There was a lot of tough love, but I'm, you know, when I look back now, I'm, I'm very grateful for everything, you know, because, Absolutely. you know, who knows where I would have been if she, I didn't have such a strong mother that really like, you know, she didn't play. She pulled me out of stolen cars. She stopped in front of a stolen car and said, get out of the car. And my, I tell my friends, run her over. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and she'd reach into the car and grab me, you know, pull me out of the car and, and drag me into the house. And, you know, that night, every, every one of those kids in the car, you know, there was a high speed chase, the police, big accident, guys got arrested, got beat with billy clubs. You know, it was, it was you know, she pulled me out of that situation. She saved my my life many, many times. Yeah, you and my brother would have got along really great. When you were <laughs> <laughs> Do you remember your first audition in LA? So, you know, I ran, like I said, I ran away from home at 15 because I, you know, I, I, me and my mom were kind of banging heads. And then I ran the streets and then, you know, I hadn't seen her in a, in a, in a while. I got arrested and I needed somebody to, I was a juvenile, so they called my mother. And my mother showed up to, uh, you know, New Jersey in a police station. I was released in her custody and I would sit on the couch and I'd watch TV and I'd see this television show called The Fall Guy with Lee Majors. It was about Hollywood and stuntmen. And, you know, so I'd watch this show and I, I and I, I saw myself doing that. And I said, I'm going to do that. You know, it was cool. It was like behind, you know, all the stunts and the cameras and the truck. You know, I was like, I'm going to do that. So when I came out to Hollywood with 200 bucks, you know, that 200 bucks ran out real fast. I, I, I didn't even know LA. So I found a, a room for rent in Van Nuys, you oh. know, and I didn't know California and, you know, Hollywood and Van Nuys, you know, this, the, you, you know, you don't, you need a car, <laughs> you know, it's not like, You're absolutely so, so now I'm deep in Van Nuys renting a room. I think it was like a, a woman who broke her leg and she needed somebody to help her, you know, throw out the trash and do some stuff. So it was a hundred bucks a month. And, you know, I lied to her, told her I had a job. I went out and found a busboy job and said, you know, I'll pay you every week when I get my money, whatever. So I literally, she took the deal. I, that let me, I had a place to live. I knew immediately I have to go find an agent. So I got a list and this is 1984. You know, I got a list of agents from the Screen Actors Guild. 
this is before GPS and, you know, I had a Thomas guide and, you know, I would literally banging on doors going down. I went through the A's, the B's, doors slamming in my face, get lost. The C's kept banging on doors, you know, going up El Centro, all these streets in Hollywood, you know, knocking on eight, these agents. And I finally found an agent at Y, the Bob, the Yenna's talent agency, a little bit of a shady kind of guy, you know, and when I first met him, he, uh, I walked into his office and he was like, uh, you know, Hey, you want a shot of tequila? <laughs> <You know? laughs> and, he, and he, you know, he had a stack of Polaroid pictures with girls with their breasts hanging. I was like, mm. I was like literally walking out the door and he said, wait, 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 there's a show, there's a part that, you know, and he said, uh, it was the fall guy. And I went, what? The fall guy. Oh. I said, you get, I go, you get me that audition. I'm going to get that part. He got me the audition and the character's name was Billy. Go figure. And Go figure. Billy was a bully. He was bullying these kids to deal drugs. And if they didn't deal drugs, he'd give them a beating. So I was literally off the plane. <laughs> you know, I had a diamond pinky ring. I, I have it over here that says Billy on it. You know, I mean, I literally went into the lobby and, uh, you know, I, I put Love my fist on in, hand, like ready. <laughs> look, yeah, I, I don't know if you could see that. Uh, it's, can you see it? Kind of. It says, Bill, yeah, it's, it's, so it says, it says Billy on it. So I literally put my fist in everybody's face in the lobby, all these actors with leather jackets. I said, what does that say? Billy, that's me. You can go home. And I told them all to go home. And then I got into the room with the casting director and, you know, the scene was I'm bullying this kid, telling him, let me tell you something about me. I'm either going to be your friend or your enemy. So it's up to you. So I didn't know anybody. I went in a room. I literally grabbed the casting director out of the chair and started like threatening her. And, you know, saliva. And she goes, time out, time out, time out. She goes, number one, she goes, never, ever, 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 ever raise your hand, put your hands on a casting director ever again. I was like, oh, I'm sorry. It's, you know, my first audition. She goes, uh, number two, she goes, you're not leaving town, are you? I go, no, why? She goes, because you got the part. Oh, perfect. She goes, but you, you can't tell the other actors outside because I got to read them out of courtesy, but you got the part. So I said, oh, okay. I walked out into the lobby. I said, go home. She told me I got the job. <laughs> So, so, so you never want to do any of that, you know, but yeah. you know, what I learned is, is a very valuable lesson in, you know, pretty much what I teach my actors is, you know, you want to own the lobby, you know, how do you do that as an actor? Well, it's your choices, your, your, you know, your, your backstory, the wardrobe, the hate, you know, however you, whatever you bring into that lobby, that's how you own the lobby. And, you know, two, what did I do in that room is I made that cast and director feel something, fear. And that's what the scene with the given circumstance of the scene was about fear. I was putting fear into another kid, you know, so light bulb went off. I knew immediately, like, you know, I asked her I, in, at, at the rap party, I said, why'd you give me the part? You know, she taff hardly me. She got me into the Screen Actors Guild. She paid me money to stay out in Hollywood. She says, you scared the crap out of me, kid. <laughs> so I was like, oh, okay, that's the secret. You know, my only job as an actor is to go into a room and make them feel whatever the given circumstance of the scene is. And I made her feel that. And I applied that same principle in every audition that I went in afterwards, not grabbing them, but making them feel whatever, making them laugh, making them cry, whatever the, the scene's about. Emotionally and that, 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 yeah, that's what, that's why I started working a lot, you know, yeah. I, because I, I found like a little thing that worked for me. So that was your first yeah. audition and it was your my first, first audition, audition, first pan gig. It's like I stepped into my television, man. I was on the yeah. set with Majors yeah. and Heather Thomas. I was like, I had to kind of pinch myself like, because this was this the show that you, you that you wanted to. Yeah, I would stare at this TV, going, "I'm gonna, do, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that," and that's exactly where I went. I literally the first audition. That's why I truly believe that you got to have this vision. You got to know what you want. Like you had a vision for this for your YouTube channel, and yeah. guess what? Now yeah. you planted the seed, and now you took massive action, and now your vision's coming to reality. The studio that I'm sitting in right now, this was a vision. You know, I had it, and I knew. Uh, you know, I I actually made a vision board. I cut out theater seats and a black box theater and movie. You know, movie posters. And you know, I I knew it before. I had the dream before. You know, I planted the seed, and then I went after it. Yeah. You know, they, I, I like the expression. If you, you know, you, you want to take the island, burn the boat. You know, when it came out to Hollywood, I didn't have no boat back. Yeah. You know, failure was not an option. You know, there was no way I was not going to, you know, I was relentless in my pursuit. You know, like I'd go up to Warner Brothers Studios and the guard at the gate would say, sorry, kid, you can't come in. 
and I'd walk around the building and I'd climb the fence and the chain link thing and I'd jump on a lot and, and you know, I'd walk up to Kevin Bacon, you know, filming a movie, Quicksilver, and nobody knew I just jumped a lot. So, they, you know, I say I'm an actor from New York and everybody, I was hanging out on the set all day long, <laughs> you know, yeah. making friends. I was that relentless. Don't tell me I can't do it. You know, I'm going to, I'm, I don't care. I'm going to do it. You know, I mean, I found out early on about breakdowns, you know, breakdowns are, you know, the, they come out every day and they, they look the roles they're looking for in whatever show and the description of the characters. And somebody told me about these breakdown things. And I was like, what? So I, they dropped them off in a manila envelope outside agents offices. So I would pick an agent office and I'd go out. And when they dropped that envelope, I'd take that envelope and I'd sit <laughs> in Denny's and I'd, I, you know, I, I created my own management. Co I would call my, you know, I, I was representing myself. I'd make a, a voice, you know, and I would get, you know, I, I would get some auditions myself and I'd go in with my envelope, you know, with one picture at the studio back in the day, you know, these delivery guys would deliver the headshots. So I would pretend I was one of those delivery guys walk past the security guy. Meanwhile, I only had one picture in the envelope and it was mine. <laughs> and then I, the casting director, they I opened the door and then I, I I pretty much tell her what I did. And, you know, they, some of them got a kick out of it. You know, some of them are like, okay, well, let's, let's see what you got. So you just, you got to listen, if you want it, you got to go after you like you freaking mean it. Yeah. You know, this is not a business. You go and give 50%. You got to give a hundred and fifty percent. You really do. And I mean, you get to where you're going clearly, you know what I mean? Yeah. You listen, I, I didn't travel 3000 miles away, leave all my friends and family, everybody behind to be a starving artist. I came, you know, if you're going to get an opportunity, you, you, if you gave up all that, you better give up, give everything you got. No one's going to knock on your door and present you with an opportunity. You've got to find the opportunities yourself. Give me a couple of your greatest influences that have, that have inspired you throughout, throughout the years. Cause you've worked with a lot of really big names. Like you've worked with like Terrence Howard, you've worked with Paul Haggis, you've worked with, uh, Forrest Whitaker, like who, who, who has inspired you as an actor? Well, as a young actor, you know, like I said, I did a movie when I was 11 that filmed Nunzio and the lead actor was an actor named David Proval. Sure. And, you know, you, you may know him from the Sopranos. He played Richie Aprile on yeah. that, but you know, David Proval, uh, he was in this film. And then I used to like sneak into the movie theater in my local movie theater. And like, you know, sometimes I pay for a ticket, but then I'd go see every movie in the whole place. I'd go from theater to theater. I'd spend the whole day in the movie theater. And I remember sneaking into a movie and I saw Martin Scorsese's uh, Mean Streets with Robert De Niro and Harvey Keitel and David Proval. And I was like, well, wait a second. That's that same actor that filmed in my block. You know, and he was playing a different character. He played a retarded kid in, in this movie, Nunzio, who thought he was Superman. And all of a sudden, he's playing this kind of borrow and a wise guy. And I kind of got like, wow, this acting thing. And, and then I saw Robert De Niro on screen. And I was mesmerized with Robert De Niro. And Robert De Niro was, you know, I, I'm, a, I'm a De Niro, Pacino, Brando. Of course. You know, those were, th those, were, those were my guys that I looked up to, you know, especially the early works. You see De Niro, you know, in Taxi Driver or or, you know, Raging Bull or, you know, Mean Streets. Or, you know, I mean, just the deer hunter. I would I would literally go into the theater and just get lost watching, you know, Al Pacino and Dog Day Afternoon or Serpico, uh, you know, this, it, you know, you know, and I've been blessed to, to have had the opportunity like to to work, you know, side by, you know, I, I screen tested for I did a movie called Pretty Woman with Richard Gere and Julia Roberts, and it was directed by Gary Marshall. And then Penny Marshall was doing a film called Awakening. She was directing it. Robert and uh, I got an audition for it and I read and, you know, I, I felt good about it. And then I went to Palm Springs and then I get a call from my agent going, hey, they want to screen test you with Robert De Niro uh, and Penny Marshall. And I literally jumped in my car and I flew back to Hollywood to work, you know, get ready for this thing. And I and I went to the studio and. It was, it was like a Sunday. It was like weird. The whole studio was like a ghost town. And I walk in and, you know, I'm walking on these New York City fake streets, you know, with the, with the, the wood, you know, holding up. It's just the exterior of the building. And I, I go into the room with Robert De Niro and, you know, I was expecting Jake LaMotta. I was Travis Bickle. You know, I, I got Leonard. He was playing this kind of sick kind of character. And um we were doing a scene and I'm playing this cab driver, Puerto Rican cab driver who picks him up and he's sick and he's trying to take care of him. And, you know, uh, it's a bad neighborhood. And so we're doing the, the so I'm screen testing, they're rolling cameras and 
Penny's there directing and there's De Niro, my idol, you know, and we're doing the scene. And during the scene, I go to lift Robert De Niro up, tell him, you know, he's, he's sick and I want to get him in my cab, but he just lays there like dead weight. And he makes me really struggle to pick him up. And then in that moment, he gave, everything just became so real in that moment. I mean, that's, that's what, what working with an actor of that caliber, you know, it, it was a little thing like that, you know, a bad actor would have stood up. I mean, he made me struggle. I literally took him, I threw him over my shoulder and I said, come on. And we started improvising, and, you know, come on, Lynn, I'm going to get you home, baby. And I'm, I'm, you know, and then finally Penny Marshall yells cut and I take De Niro and I put him down, you know, gingerly, I put him down he's, <laughs> and he goes, that was good. That was good. <laughs> and I was like, <laughs> you know, I, I, you know, they, they, they actually, they cut that part out before they even made the movie, but I floated out of that room. For me, it was like, I got to work with my idol, man. The kid, I used to sit in a theater at, you know, 15 and watch him on the screen, you know, and I grew up, you know, Rocky was a big influence to in my life. I was a little kind of scrawny little kid and I was getting bullied in, in school and, and then I saw Rocky and I started training, you know, I started hitting the bag. I started hitting the weights, you know, eating raw eggs, running around the center. I thought, you know, I was, was in training mode. I, I, I built what I sold to Hollywood in that time. You know, I was, but it, it, I was so inspired. And I used to watch this TV show called Taxi with Tony Danza. And it was one of my favorite shows, you know, cut to me in Hollywood doing Who's the Boss. And I'm, I'm acting opposite Tony Danza on the show and we do, you know, we do our table reading, whatever. And then we go play golf and we go to the Witsit golf course and we play golf and who's there? Sylvester Stallone. Hey, Tony, what's up now? Now, next thing you know, I'm playing golf and I'm looking and there's Tony Bantha and there's Rocky and me. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, it's, it was, it was kind of surreal, you know, like, wow. Yeah. How the hell did I do that? That's wild. You mentioned Forrest Whitaker, you know, when I work with him, you know, he's an Academy Award winning actor, you know, and here I am face to face with him. And he says to me, I think he, he, he flubbed the line or something like that. And he said, uh, sorry, I'm a little nervous. And I went, oh, you're nervous. I get, I go, you got a fucking Oscar. <laughs> it, freed, it, it literally freed me up because, you know, I was, I'm, I was nervous, you know, I, I excited yeah. working with, you know, Forrest Whitaker and, you know, he literally said, I'm a little nervous. And I was like, wow, you know, all actors get that. You know, it's, it's, it, was, it, it was a gift. You know, if someone like that caliber can be that, then I can be it. Oh, that's really cool to go from being a little kid who is watching all these movies, idolizing all these people, and then cut to where you are then, and then being in movies with these people. Sure. Listen, I, I, I grew up watching Richard Gere. You know, I was a big Richard Gere fan, you know, American Gigolo, man. When I saw American Gigolo, I started dressing, you know, which I went from leather jackets to, you know, little wool ties and, you know, dress shirts and, you know, started, you know, looking at GQ magazine. I, I changed my after seeing American Gigolo, his early works, uh, Officer and a Gentleman, um, Breathless, you know, some of those movies. I I'd watch him. I'd sit in that theater and I'd watch him. And then, you know, here I am on Hollywood Boulevard, the streets closed off and me and Richard Gere, you know, sitting in, uh, you know, the car and Pretty Woman, you know, we're getting ready to do a scene. And I was like, wild. this is wild. It really is wild. Listen, if I can do it, if a street kid from me, you know, from Brooklyn could come out to Hollywood with 200 bucks and make the dream a reality, then why can't you? Why can't you listen is out there? So if you have a dream, you got to go after it. Yeah, exactly. You got to go after it like you freaking mean it because it was placed. If this dream was given to you, it's a gift and it's your obligation to, you know, take that gift and shine that light, yeah. you know, make a difference. Absolutely. No, absolutely. I wanted to ask you about your humanitarian work because you're also a, hum a humanitarian and uh, you travel to other countries and you, um, you make all these incredible contributions to like poverty stricken societies. And I wanted you to tell me about one of your more recent trips that you took and what it was yeah. like and what you did for the communities. Like I said, you know, what I really found in my life that it's, it's not about me, you know, I mean, early on, it was it, the young Billy Gallo, the young actor, it was, a, it was a lot of me, me, ego based kind of, you know, and, and I truly found, you know, that it's all about contribution. How do you, how do I make a difference in somebody else's life? And, yeah. you know, that fills me up. And, you know, I, 
I got involved with an organization that goes to some of the poorest of poorest places, you know, with people that, you know, living in like Guatemala in the slums and the garbage stumps, you know, people living, living in a garbage stump that they pick through trash to find some food to eat or something to sell. And it's, it's a horrifying. I, I can't even tell you what I saw there. I mean, it was like vultures and humans fighting for a scrap. I mean, it was kind of scary, you know, yeah. um, you know, it was, it's, it, it, there was a lot of, it was very dangerous. There was a lot of gangs that kind of ran, ran the, the La Limonada, which is, it's the slums of Guatemala. And, you know, I've traveled there and we, we went there and we built a, a bakery so they could make some food to feed themselves. Um, we've built, uh, you know, I've, I've traveled to Guatemala many times. I mean, I think this is my fourth trip over there. We built a church in the middle of the jungle. Um, they had a little, like, couple of sticks with the aluminum thing with, you know, a tarp, you know, that was there. And if you see the beautiful church uh, that we built, me and, and some of my men that I went on this journey with, um, it was, you know, we raised the funds and, and we went and we built this church. Uh, we've built homes, many, many homes for people that don't have a home. And uh, it's been so rewarding. I mean, I can't tell you, you know, these little kids to, to just put a smile on kids. You know, I'd come with gifts, you know, I mean, I was in my son's place, soccer. I did a fundraising thing and they gave like, you know, uniforms and soccer balls and all this. I mean, I carried like duffel bags of equipment and we went to this girl's home um, in, in uh, Santa Rosa where, where these little girls have been really abused. You know, they've had a rough, rough life and you know, our mission there was to uh, to do repairs, but also to put a second row of bob wire, razor wire around the perimeter because the bad guys would try to come in and sneak in at night and take the girls again. Oh, there was a men's prison. So we, we our mission was to fortify this place. I mean, they had armed guards with machine guns, you know, standing outside of the place. Yeah. Uh, so it was, you know, it was, it was kind of hairy, you know, but to put, you know, you have to see these little girls that have been abused, you know, sexually abused, trafficked, you know, just to see them put on these uniforms, you know, that, you know, I'm, I'm in the, the South Bay, there's, there's a lot of wealth here, you know, so to have all these uniforms and soccer balls and play with them and, you know, let them know that, you know, men aren't bad guys, you know, we came over there and just, it was just to see the smile on their faces was, was so powerful. It was so rewarding, you know, to, to, you know, see a woman who's got a handicapped child that's got cancer, you know, that's, you know, struggling and, and to build her a home, you know, with a, and get her, her, her daughter, a wheelchair and put a ramp in there in the house for her, you know, it was just, it fills your heart up when you can make a difference in somebody else's life. So that's why I do it. You know, unfortunately, you know, due to COVID, we haven't been able to go on a yearly mission trip, um, to, you know, travel to some of these destinations, but, uh, you know, things, since things are easing up, you know, we, we're, we're still feeding them. You know, there, we just packed last week and we packed 150,000 meals and, and shipped it to these people that don't have any food. Yeah. So it's, it's, to me, it's, it's what life's all about. You know, it's about making a difference in somebody else's life. Yeah. I saw some of the work that you did on your website and it's the videos that you, that you have on there. It's, it's really, really touching stuff. I mean, you guys are building stuff from the ground up. And yeah, like no, we desolate areas. It's a shovel. <laughs> you yeah. know, you don't have any power. You know, the, the yeah. cinder blocks, literally, we make a chain with cinder blocks, exactly. you know, and hand them off and, you know, travel them down the, the road. You know, the sandbags had to be carried on your shoulders, you know, down terrain into the middle of nowhere. Yeah, I've, I've traveled internationally, but I've never traveled to like places in, in need. You know what I mean? I've never traveled to places that are like in. It, that are dangerous and are in severe, severe need. So that's really, that's really inspiring. And it's really heartwarming to know that there are people that are, that, that do things like that. Once I did it, I did it one time and I'm, I'm hooked. Sure. <laughs> you can't get me not to go. It's like at a, a whole different kind of, a whole different kind of level. So that's really, that's really wonderful. Thank um, you. Absolutely. Tell me more about your acting studio. 
it's, it's kind of weird, man. It's just, I, I got a calling, you know, I was, I, I got a, like a, like a little voice, you know, and, and it was like, I found this card outside my church on the floor, uh, floor and it's, it's, it said time, talent, treasure. How are you sharing your time, your talent, and your treasure? And I thought about it and I was like, hmm, how am I sharing my time, my talent, and my treasure? And, you know, like I said, it was, it was you know, it was about me. Uh, and then I real, uh, realized that how do I, how do I make a difference in somebody else's life? And I, and I got, I got a great experience. I mean, I've been through the trenches in Hollywood. I know this business because I had to carve my way into it, you know? So I got a calling and it was like, you got to open up a school and in the community, in this community, South Bay, which I love. It's an amazing, you know, I don't know if you've been to Manhattan beach, but yeah, I, beautiful. You know, I look out my window, I have, you know, a, an ocean view. I mean, I, I, I'm living in paradise, you know, with my beautiful wife and my son. So I'm truly blessed. And I wanted to give back, you know, well, how, how can I make a difference? And, you know, I got this calling about opening up my school. And I did. I, I, I literally came in here and I, I, I with a sledgehammer and I built this beautiful studio behind me. This is not a virtual thing. I, I crack up on people, you know, I can, you can actually come sit. And, yeah. I can actually go sit in the chair over here, you know. It's like... <laughs> This is, this is not a virtual background. This is a real, you know, this is a real theater. You know? People so must take that for a green screen. <laughs> yeah. So I just knew in my heart, like, this is, this is what I got to do. And, and I built it and I've been blessed. I mean, I'm going almost on eight years and I get to make a difference. You know, actors bang on the door. They got no idea how to get started in the business. And when I'm done with them, they're working actors. I yeah. can't guarantee that they're going to be big time movie stars or whatever, but I, they're going to be in the game. Yeah, they're you know, they're going to start auditioning. I'm, I, I build them the tools they need. This is a full functioning studio. I have rolling walls. I build sets. You know, I figure out what's your cast ability, you know, what kind of roles you see yourself playing. And I actually film you. We, we work on it and I film you so you have that piece of footage. And I help build demo reels so actors have a solid tool to show their talent you know, on these, you know, LA casting actors, access backstage, they have some footage of themselves really, you know, what's their castability? What's their star power? What are they selling to Hollywood? I knew what I was selling when I came out to Hollywood. You know, I was selling me, a street kid from New York. You know, people said, oh, you got to lose the accent. Are you going to do that? And I was like, no, this is who I am. This is, yeah. this is what makes me different from the other guys. You know, I mean, I, I, my TV series with Matthew Perry. Okay. When the breakdown on that, they, they wanted a surfer dude from Venice beach with a parrot on his shoulder. That's how they explained the character. When I read the script, I was like, no, I saw him like the Fonz with the leather jacket, you know, cool. I grew up watching happy, happy days with Henry Winkler. He, you know, drove a motorcycle, leather jacket. He snapped his fingers. The girls came running. That's how I saw the character. So that's what I brought into the room. I even played up the New York accent a little bit to, because I found that if I did that, the lines got funnier. Yeah, absolutely. And, and then, you know, I served that up to them and they went yummy, yummy. Mm, that tastes good. And they gave me my own show. You know, I mean, they, I got cast in a series called Second Chance and I was the fifth banana on the show. I was the next door neighbor. And then they canceled that show. And they came to me and said, we want to give you your own show called Boys Will Be Boys. And it was, it's you and Matthew Perry. And I was like, all right, cool. You know, but th this is what I sold. So I know you have your own unique gift. This is, you know, who you are. And, and you, you got to, you're a product, you're selling a product to Hollywood. So you got to know what you're selling. So what I do is I truly figure out what's your cast ability. And we work on that and we film that. So you have that piece of footage. Let's say you can play, oh, I could play a gangster. Go oh, great. Let's have a piece of footage of you playing a gangster. I could play a cop. Cool. You're, you're a cop. You know, so now we build you a demo reel that really truly shows your talent. I got a photo studio in the back. So, you know, it's a one stop shop. You're going to have professional headshots. You're going to have a professional demo reel. And that's the stuff that's going to go live on your actors access backstage, LA casting. And, and you're going to start getting auditions because if I'm a casting director and I'm looking for this type and oh, I click on your picture, Oh, it looks good. Wonder if he can act. Oh, look at that. There's a demo reel. Click. Oh, the guy can act. Great. Let's bring him in. Let's send him on a self tape audition. Boom. And you know, my actors are landing jobs left and right because 
I, I teach them, I don't teach acting. I don't, I don't want to see anybody act. Uh, you know, I, I teach the truth. What do you got? Your life experience, everything that's ever happened to you in your life, the good, the bad, the ugly, all that stuff. That's your gold as an actor. Everything that I went through as a child, all that stuff, the shit, that's my gold in my actor toolbox. I, know, I just personalize. I just take my truth and hand it over to the characters. You know, I play characters, you know, guys that I grew up with, those wise guys, I played them on TV. I just did, I played them. A lot of what you had gone through as a kid seems like it has translated into your work. Absolutely. So that's why I built this place because I know what I do works. You know, I got a track record. I got agents coming, calling me up from Hollywood going, hey, you know, when you have a big audition, uh, a series regular, a big film or whatever, they call me up and can, can you can you squeeze, you know, my actor in, he's got a big audition. Can you coach them and tape them? And I, I'm like, yeah, sometimes I can't, but because my reputations come in Hollywood that if you train with me and I tape you, you're going to book that part. <laughs> I mean, I, I last eight actors that I put on tape, they all booked the job. Nice. So I got a pretty good track record and it's getting out there that, you know, you know, I know what it takes. You know, you can't play it safe. You got to make big, bold, strong choices. You got to you, you got to leave nothing to the imagination. You got to serve it up. You got to show them the character. They think they know what they want until they see you and you change their mind. That's how I land in my series. That's how I land in roles in Hollywood is, is I showed them the character. You know, they thought they wanted something else till I walked in the door and I don't leave anything to the imagination. I show them this is the character. You know, that's truly how my actors are working because we, we don't, we don't play safe. Safe is boring. Stay home. Oh, you're wasting your time. Yes, so be yes. vulnerable, be dangerous, you know, be whatever the given circumstances of the scene. How do you load it up? How do you take your soul and leave a piece of your soul behind on that tape or in that audition? And then they will remember you. And then those casting fun. directors will become a fan of your work. Exactly. And if you get a couple of casting directors that are a fan of your work, they're going to keep bringing you back in. And it's just the numbers game till you land that role. I want my actors to be getting dirty, getting, you know, try shit, fall down, dust yourself off, get back up. That's the only way you stretch as an artist. You know, I, I, my class is called the actor's gym because you're going to sweat. Yeah. You're going to work out. You're going to, you're going to, you, I'm going to push you past your comfort zone. You know, so when you're done, when you get to that audition, it's like, oh, that ain't, that ain't shit. You should have seen what my, I did in acting class, you know, the other night. I love it. Man. So I prepare my actors to, you know, be the, the, the other actors in the lobby or the other audition, they can't even compete. They're just trying to memorize some lines and survive the audition to hope somebody likes them. My actors are coming into the room. I'm not, listen, I'm not here to get anything. I'm here to give. I'm doing you a favor. I'm showing you after you see me, you can tell everybody else to go home. I'm showing you the character. I'm not, I'm, I, I've outworked, I've out prepped, I've out choice. I'm bringing the wardrobe, the, the hair, everything into that room or in that tape. And it's literally, you got the actors with the, uh, the, the, the blue curtain and the, you know, sides in the hand acting. And then you have my act is that piece of footage. And it's like, I could take that footage and put it right on screen. It's lit right, it's frame right, it's you got the wardrobe of the character, the head, the accent, everything. You're serving it all up and it's right there in front of them. Yeah. And believe me, when that's going through thousands of self-tapes and then boom, they land on yours, it's like, whoa, wait a second. And if you take a piece of your soul and you leave it there on, you know, you personalize and substitute, they're gonna take notice. You may not be right for that part, but you're gonna make a fan. Exactly. Yeah. Nice, man. Oh, I love it. All right, well, the next set of questions are specifically aimed at the horror community and for your experiences regarding Night of the Demons. So my first question for you would be, are you a fan of horror films? You know, I am. Um, I haven't, you know, my, I, I've been with my wife for 25 years and she hates horror films. <laughs> She's not a horror person. So, you know, I don't get to watch a lot of horror in my house because every time I go, oh, let's watch that. She's like, no, <laughs> you know, it's not like I'm sitting, I have a lot of time on my hands to watch horror films, but you know, I am a, a, a horror fan. I've, you know, I grew up watching some of the classics, you know, like, uh, let's see, The Exorcist. I remember seeing that and it scared the crap out of me. Um, or the, you know, what was that movie? Uh, there was a movie that scared the shit out of me as a kid. Oh, it was called Trilogy of Terror. Have you ever seen Trilogy oh, yeah. of Terror? Aaron Black. Yeah, with the little doll, with the little oh, voodoo sure. doll. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's a, that's, a pretty, that's a pretty scary movie. I saw that for the first time last year, actually. Yeah, that one scared the crap out of me. Uh, let's see, oh, the, you know, The Omen. Oh, I love The Omen. Um, Psycho. 
you know, those are, those are the, some of those, those movies that I saw, you know, as a young kid. And I was like, whoa, they scared the crap. Out of me. Yeah, no, those, are, those are great movies. Those are really yeah. great movies, man. Couldn't, couldn't sleep after that. Sure. Tell me about the audition process for Night of the Demons. That's another role that I, you know, I showed him the character. You know, yeah. Sal Romero. I was like, okay, Sal, you know, who is Sal? You know, that's, you know, you, there's clues, you know, in the script. And, and I just saw Sal, you know, I said, said Sal Romero. I think I made it, I said he was half Spanish, half Italian. And, you know, I, 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 I played the accent. Hey, careful, man. She's acting really fucking weird. You know, I, I was like, I, I knew who my competition was. You know, I had auditioned for it and... I went and I had a few callbacks and then there was like between me and a, literally my best friend, you know, I'm, I'm godfather to his son. Like we, we grew up in Hollywood. We, you know, we, we run into the same actors on the audition. It was the same actors, same type. You know, we look a lot alike, you know, there was the Danny Nucci's and Ray Oriel. And, you know, I mean, there, there were all of these actors that, we compete against each other on a constant basis, you know, and, you know, I was the guy booking the parts. So, you know, when they saw me coming in, they go, oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. just walking in the door, I see them like get deflated. Um, but, you know, it was between me and um, my friend, Ray Oriel. I don't know if you've ever seen Blood In, Blood Out. Uh, he, he, he plays, he plays a character called spider, but you know, when we saw each other, it was with the callback was at uh, red Fox building in Hollywood. And, and, and I walked out and there he was, and we're both standing out in the lobby and, you know, we're, we're friends. We'd hang out, but I said, "Mm -mm, I don't want to talk to you right now. I'll talk to you afterwards. You know, this is the, it's, I had my game face on and we're going, I'm going in there. I'm going to go get that part. Good luck. You know, um, so, you know, I walked in and, you know, I brought the character in the door and, 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 you know, luckily for me, they chose me because that movie was uh, probably the most fun I've had in making a movie, you know, in my years in the business. I mean, I've worked on a lot of sets and I work with a lot of actors, but that movie was just, it was a blast. We had so much fun making that movie. Did you guys have any idea at the time? I mean, you probably wouldn't have an idea at the time, but did you did you realize that it was going to have the impact or expect that it would have the impact that it would have all these years later? No, no, absolutely not. You know, it was just, you know, it all I was, look, I was starring in a film, you know, yeah. um, it had a cool cast. You know, I remember meeting with all the other actors the first day and I was like, oh, this is cool. You know, everybody, a lot of pretty girls and, you know, I was like, this is going to be, it was called, originally the script was called Halloween Party. Yeah. You know, and it was, that's exactly what it was. It was a party. You know, we were, we, you know, we lived in a house. I mean, that house, that house, it was, our dressing rooms were upstairs, you know. Oh, inside um, the actual house. So inside the actual house. So the top floor, you know, I shared a rest dressing room with, uh, with, you know, uh, with Hal Havens and, and there was, uh, you know, we were all on that top floor. Everybody had their dressing rooms and, you know, the uh, makeup was amazing, you know? So I'd walk out of my dressing room and there would be, you know, Lance Fenton with his eyes missing, you know, walking down the hallway, <laughs> you know? Mm. Or, you know, Hal with the burn makeup, you know? It was just like, and and the, the production designer and the, you know, just everything about that place, they made it so scary. So it was like you were in a haunted house. <laughs> sure. And there was a lot of, you know, we were all pulling pranks on each other and scaring each other. And there was a lot of, you know, we just, it was a lot of fun. Well, speaking of this, um, like the, the, the effects, what was it like? Because you have the, the lesser of the fates in comparison to all the other the, the characters. What was it like working with all the special effects and all the blood? Well, I'll tell you, I'll tell you a quick funny story is, is you know, I, I found the original script to Halloween Party. And, you know, I, I read it. And I was cracking up because, you know, in the original script, I get my arm torn off. Okay. I get, I get full possession in the, in, in the, in the original script script. So when I met with Steve Johnson and he did, you know, the, the, the mold of my arm and, you know, they were doing a head mold on me where they put this, you know, cast on your frigging head. And 
I remember when they put the, you know, it's this stuff and it drips, it closes off your ears. You can't hear anything and your eyes, you can't see anything and you can't, your lips, you know, you can't open up your mouth. And then this stuff starts dripping. You got straws in your nose to breathe. And this stuff started like kind of closing off one of my nostrils. You know, you got to, it's kind of, it's, you know, it's, it's all over your head. You know, I was trying to, you know, be cool, but I, I'm a little claustrophobic and you put me, you got to put a cast on my head and I can't breathe. I was like, get this shit off. I was like, <laughs> <laughs> so we tried it a couple of times and I, I tore it off two or three times. I was like, no, nah, I can't I'm, forget about it. Yeah. So they literally, they, they literally rewrote it. Um, and they gave my arm to, you know, uh, Max's character and they gave the possession, you know, to, so I, I was not possessed. They gave me a stake in my heart, you know, a little yeah. piece of wood that that's on the wall right there. It was a piece of balsa wood. And I remember there was, you know, it was, it was like when I, when I would take a breath, it would come, you know, it would go like, it was on a seatbelt. So I go, and it would move like this. And I, I think there was a line we did that got cut out of the movie. Is this a stake in my heart or am I happy to see you? Oh, that's <laughs> yeah. oh they cut it out. They should have left that in there. It was just, amazing i mean steve johnson's makeup in it is just mind-blowing those actors are really they, they were troopers because some of them sat in that makeup chair for a long long time oh i bet it's a lot of extensive makeup that was one thing i remember especially seeing it as a young kid that i just the, the makeup effects that movie scared the hell out of me scared the hell out of me have you ever seen any of the sequels you know, when they did the reboot, um, I, I tried watching that one. And I was like, ah, nah, it's the OGs, the legit. Yeah, this is like, why would they even try to make a remake of, of, of a classic? Like, you You're know, not Night missing of much, man. You're not missing much. Yeah. I've, never, I've never watched, the, you know, the other ones, two or three. Would you ever consider being in another horror film? Because outside of Night of the Demons, it doesn't look like you, you've done much, if not any other horror movies. Yeah, you know, I mean, listen, if some of there was a good script that came along and, and hit my desk and, I, and there was a cool, cool character, absolutely. You know, I'm an actor. So, you know, if there's a good role, absolutely. I don't care what the genre is, if it's a good role. I love that. OK, you know what? And, and I, I guess I just have one last question for you, man. Um, when was the last time you watched Night of the Demons? And does it bring back fond memories for you? And did you enjoy making the movie? So I guess that's three questions wrapped up into one. Yeah, so I last time I watched Night of the Demons was, it was like I don't know, there was a, a cat full cast reunion like I don't know five years ago or something like that, and it was pretty awesome because you know, just I just love that cast. When we we may not have seen each other for years, and then when we get together for I, I've done maybe a couple of conventions, you know, autograph signing things or like days of the dead or something like that. And, and we, when we get together, it's truly like a family, you know, I mean, I, I got a love for them. We've, we got this history together. So, you know, I, I think it was like five years ago, I went to one of these events and, you know, signed autographs and, you know, the fans, I love the fans, the most incredible fans you can imagine are, are horror fans and night of the demons fans. I mean, they're like real fans. I, I, I don't know too many, I, People that have, you know, Amelia's got, you know, people got Angela tattoos or Stooge tattoos. I mean, they got an ink on their body. That's how much they love this movie. Yeah. You can't tell you how many tattoos. I'm like, what's with that tattoo? <laughs> 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 but uh, it was it was just an awesome experience. Um, watching the movie, it was like watching the Rocky Horror Picture Show. I mean, like the audience knew every line, you know. It, it was just... It, it, it after all those years it really stands up the movie's still you know a classic it's a cult classic you know and you know when we made it you know sometimes i cringe at some of the stuff you know because we had one take at it you know like the stuff with you know tell uh tell your sister handsome honk sal is here and i brought my pet snake for her to play with you know i mean literally you know poor, poor donnie jeff coat i was working with, with him he had to go home so you know they were doing his covers and then you know he had to go home because he was a minor so i like got one take at it you know so that yeah. lives on the film forever you know <laughs> but it's it's you know it's it's a classic I, I i had the best time making that film um and i truly all those actors on that were amazing and we had so much fun
it's it's a great movie it's literally one of my one of my top 10 favorite horror films and um it 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 stands the test of time and uh, i consider it a classic i watch it every halloween i watched it last night well i got i got a gift for you i gotta remind me i i found um a limited edition like the actual invitation from 30 something years ago Get out. to the night of the deems yeah well you are invited to the party uh, the actual invitation. So I'll I'll uh, I'll send one your way. I'm I'm really excited to have it. I appreciate that, no. man. Well, uh, Billy, thank you so much for doing this, man. I know you, uh, it's my you're pleasure. a very busy person, so I will let you go and get on with your day. I really appreciate your time, and I'll be in touch with you. And I I I, I can't thank you enough. Thank you so much for this. Oh, it's it's my pleasure. Good luck with the the YouTube channel. I, I think it's awesome that you actually had a dream and now you're going after it. And look. You're making it a reality. So yeah, for me to be a little part of this and maybe help you, you know, get that, make that dream a reality, it's my honor. Well, you you've really made a difference, man. Thank you. Keep doing keep doing really amazing things, and just know that you've you've really made a difference in in my in my day in my life, and I really appreciate it, man. Awesome. Take care. Take care of yourself. Thank you so much. Take All care. Right. You're welcome. Bye bye. bye, -bye.